Questions are surrounding the federal government's ideas towards sophisticated investing. Let's take a look at what this means. I'm Mike Loder. Funding Futures starts right now. Hello and welcome back to Funding Futures, presented by the team at Venture Crowd, where each episode we will take a look at the top spots for conscious investing and share the future of some clever companies that are expanding. As the world enters one of the most transformative periods of innovation ever witnessed, the federal government is considering making it harder for investors to qualify as sophisticated investors and reducing access to risky, riskier asset classes such as venture capital. To discuss how this will affect Australia's technology and venture capital ecosystems, I am joined by Venture Crowd CEO Steve Marbani. Steve, it's always good to see you. What are the proposed changes we're witnessing when it comes to sophisticated investor rules and what impact are we seeing? Hey Mike, it's good to be with you. Um, firstly, I think it's important to note that no decision has been made by the federal government on the changes at this stage, but what is being proposed by some external groups is to increase the salary and asset thresholds for an individual to be considered a sophisticated investor from a salary of $250,000 a year and net assets of $2.5 million to an annual salary of $450,000 a year and net assets of 4.5 million, so a significant increase. And what that would do is um, reduce the percentage of people who can invest in things like startups and high growth technology businesses from 16% of the population down to about 1%, significantly reducing uh, the volume of private capital in the market and making it harder for innovators to raise the capital they need to build um, the businesses of the future. And these are businesses that have historically created new industries and created yeah. new jobs thinking. And along the way, they've delivered significant value for everybody involved. Now, of course, there's risk involved in venture capital. Everybody knows that. But there's risk involved in everything worth doing. The bottom line, I think, here is if we want to transition from being a country that just digs things out of the ground to one that has a global role in what will be the most transformative decade of innovation ever, we need to focus on optimising all of the levers that support a thriving entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem. And that absolutely includes having the most inclusive and efficient um, private capital market possible, not the other way around. Yeah, very well said. So the flow on effect of this, uh, if and when it goes through, what do you think it will be on Australia's technology and of course, uh, the venture capital sector more broadly speaking? Well, I think it's highly problematic because I think, um, as I said, that the, the private capital markets play a really, really important role in the technology sector. And by restricting them, you're just making it harder for um, the difficult phase of you know, um, prototyping all the way through to building an actual company, which can then go on to obtain traditional forms of venture capital and traditional funding just makes that a lot more difficult. Yeah, sort of puts the handbrake on a little bit. But the rationale for the changes to the sophisticated investor rules, I understand, is customer protection. Is it not reasonable to restrict access to risky investments to these sophisticated investors as well? Take us through a bit about that. Well, financial services have always been designed with consumer protection in mind, and they should, and no one is suggesting that that should change. But this rationale, the rationale for these proposals is flawed in my view for two key reasons. The first is it assumes that a person's level of financial literacy increases as their salary or assets increase, and that's simply not the case. When I was a partner at PwC, I was surrounded by highly capable junior team members qualified accountants and lawyers and consultants who were not earning anywhere near $250,000 per annum, let alone four fifty, dollars And they were all more than capable of running the ruler over a startup opportunity and assessing for themselves whether this was a project they wanted to back. The Australian entrepreneurial ecosystem needs those people engaged and actively participating in the private capital market if it's going to thrive. This needs to be part of our cultural DNA. And I reckon the best way for governments to support that is to support the education of the next generation investors into VC, not restrict them from it. And the second reason it's flawed is because it's completely out of whack with what's happening in other parts of the world. In the UK and the US, for example, the salary mm. threshold is under 200K, the equivalent of Australian $200,000, which is less than our current threshold, and less than half of what's being proposed. And that means if you're a sophisticated investor in the UK, you would not be sophisticated enough for Australian financial services laws, which is insane. In the last decade, as a nation, we have started to build a strong early stage venture capital industry. 
with more people participating in a growing number of world leading technology companies being incubated right here. And if we want that to continue, and I think we do, we need to recognise the very important role that individual angel investors play in that process. Without them, many of these companies would never have gone on to become global heroes. So we need to encourage the next generation of investors to participate in the venture capital sector, not restrict them from it. Very, very well said by you. I think uh, you touched on education there as well. I think that's an important aspect of this. Steve, thank you for joining us on the program. It's all the time I've got for you for today. We'll keep an eye on this one and hopefully speak to you again very soon. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Right back at you.